Have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Uh, if your Bible is like my Bible, it's on page 570. Uh, but turn over there. We're going to be in chapter 6 when we pick up in just a minute. But while you are, are uh, turning over there, we started a new series last week. Small Steps, Big Changes. Because here's what I believe in 2020. Number one, I believe God has a big plan for Mission City Church. Number two, I believe that God has a big plan for your life, that 2020 could be the greatest year for your life in your walk with Jesus Christ. But for most of that, us, for that to become a reality, there, there needs to be some disciplines, and we don't like that word, some disciplines uh, that we work on in our life. And so as we jump in today, what I want you to do, this is the audience participation, make sure everybody's awake, we're all together here. And what I want you to do is think about the last day that you worked. So if you work Monday through Friday, that would be last Friday. Very good, you're there. If you work on the weekend, maybe you worked yesterday. But think about the last day you worked and think about, think about your day's progression. So you wake up in the morning, maybe the first thing you do is check Instagram, and then you get a cup of coffee, and then you spend a little bit of time in God's Word, and then you eat breakfast, and then you take a shower, and then you get dressed, and if you have kids, you get them off to whatever it is that, that they're going to be doing that day, and then you drive to work, and at work, you probably do similar things all the time at work, and so you walk through those and do those similar things that you do every day, and then you, you drive home. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have driven home from work and not remembered the trip, right? Isn't that crazy? Like that's actually scary that we can drive all the way home. We, we don't even remember the drive. You, you take the drive home, you come home, you change clothes, you eat dinner, you spend some time with the kids, you put them in bed, maybe you read a little bit, you check some emails. If you're married, guys, you make your move, you're rejected, you go to sleep, same thing. The next day, right? That's just kind of kind of what happens. That that's that's our system. That's our habits that we walk through. Much of what you do normally isn't a result of conscious choices, but a result of daily habits. So you're not making decisions to do those things. You've just fallen into a routine, and those have become your habits. But you're not consciously thinking through what you're doing. Duke University did a study that confirmed this, and they found that over 40% of what you do daily isn't a result uh, of decision-making, but a result of habits. So 40% of what we do, I'm not making a conscious decision to, to make those steps or to do those things. It's just habits. It's just the routine that I'm in. And so as we started last week, if, if you missed last week, kind of review a little bit, or if you've slept since last week and you forgot about what we talked about, one of the things that we said was most of us have the same desires. And what I mean by that is if I ask you this morning, how many of you want to grow in your relationship with God this year? Raise your hand. Pretty much 100%. How many of you want to make wise financial decisions this year? Raise your hand. How many of you want to be healthy this year? Raise your hand. So pretty much 100% across the board, we all want the same things, but we have different results. Some of us don't follow through on those desires or those plans, and, and there's different reasons for that. Sometimes we don't follow through because we're not patient. Right? I'm not patient, and, and so we start something. I'm going to be healthy this year. And, and so we eat you know, salmon two times during the week, and, and then we weigh ourselves, and we didn't lose any weight. Or, or you got on the treadmill three times, and you actually gained two pounds. Like, we're not patient. This isn't working. Or, or, or you, you decided that you were going to read God's Word, and you did that three times, and God hasn't transformed your life yet, and you still wanted to yell at your kids, and so you quit, and you give up. We're not patient in seeing things through. Some of us fall short because we wrongly conclude that small good decisions or small bad decisions don't really matter. 
very few of us wreck our lives with one decision. Most of the time, it's small decisions on top of small decisions that lead us to a place where our life is a wreck. Little compromises, little lies. So, so we think wrongly that little good decisions don't add up. Eating the third cookie, well, it's just one extra cookie. Well, over 365 days, those good decisions would have made an impact. Or eating the third cookie, over 365 days, those small bad decisions make an impact. So we wrongly conclude small good or bad decisions don't matter. And and then we talked about that goals don't determine success systems, but systems determine success. Not goals, but systems determine success. And there's been a quote from last week that I've just been thinking about and thinking about that successful people do consistently what others do occasionally. Right? I just can't get that out of my mind that, that, that successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Now, you may hear that quote and you're like, yeah, but you're talking about like CEOs and millionaires and those super high achieving successful people. No, we need to define success. What is success? Success is maximizing God-given opportunities. So successful people, those who maximize God-given opportunities, do consistently what others, maybe me or you, do occasionally, right? Maximizing those God-given opportunities. So this morning what I want us to do is I want us to look at a biblical example of someone who had some systems set up in their life. They took small steps that made a big change, that made an impact on their life in a positive way. And so we're going to be in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 is where we're going to be. When I mention Daniel to you, what do you think about? Daniel and? Daniel and the lion's den, right? And so so just to give you some background leading up to where we are today, uh, there were two Two kingdoms at this point. So Israel had been divided into a northern and southern kingdom. There was the kingdom of Israel. There was the kingdom of Judah. Judah had been taken over. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came in, took over the southern kingdom, took over Judah. And part of what he did is he relocated or had uh, some, some young men relocated who were part of the southern kingdom's nobility and, and, and uh, kingly line and basically had them relocated to Babylon where he was going to, to retrain them and equip them to be leaders in his kingdom. So there were 120 young men. It says that they were good looking, sharp, nobility uh, of kingly blood or or the the royal line of blood that they brought there. These were leaders and that Daniel was the most exceptional of all of them. That he was the leader, that he, he stood out from all of the rest. And so as we pick up in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Right? That, that's huge. That that Daniel was not just a leader, he wasn't just exceptional, he was such a leader and so exceptional that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to set him basically as the number two guy over the entire kingdom. Daniel exhibited spiritual excellence and dedication and discipline and leadership. But it was probably the little things in Daniel's life that led to his success. It was the little steps, the little disciplines that he applied to his life that made him the man that he was. Now, we're going to see in just a second, success breeds jealousy. There were people who didn't like Daniel's success. They didn't like that Daniel was achieving so much. And what we find in our own life, again, is success brings, breeds jealousy. That's why when you go to the gym, if you go to the gym, there's always that person that stands out and they're like, man, they're in good shape. They don't just have a six-pack. They have an eight-pack. 
right? And, and they're in great shape, and they work out, and they eat right, and you look at them, and then you look at you, and you're jealous because of their success. And what happens when we're jealous because of their success, because of their discipline, we make up reasons why they can do what they can do and why we haven't. Or if they were in our situation, they wouldn't look like that. If she had four kids like I do, she wouldn't look like that. Those kinds of things. Success breeds jealousy. And so we're seeing that here in verse 4. It says that this, the administrators, the satraps, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. That will never be said of a politician today, right, of, of any of them. I don't care what side you're on. They could find nothing wrong, no corruption, because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So when we look at the life of Daniel, we see a story of success. We see small steps, habits, disciplines daily that led Daniel to who he was. And that's one of the big things is we talk about these small steps that lead to big change. We focus so often on the what, what we need to do, instead of starting with who God is calling us to be. Daniel was focusing on the who. Now, what did this get him? We've already seen that other leaders in the government were jealous and they were plotting against Daniel, and they could find no corruption. He did his job perfect. So what they found was the only way to get to Daniel was through his faith. And so we're going to have to trick the king to be able to get to Daniel. And so they went to King Nebuchadnezzar, basically built up his ego because they looked at Nebuchadnezzar as a god, and had Nebuchadnezzar basically come up with an edict that no one can pray to anyone else except for the king for 30 days. Now, this was obviously not going to be acceptable for Daniel. He couldn't follow through with this pledge because he was a worshiper of the one true God. So, so look in verse 10 of Daniel 6. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in the upper chamber of his house open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So just leave that verse up there for just a second. A couple of things that really stand out to me when we look at this. First of all, how many times a day did he pray? Three times a day, as he'd always done. So, so this was not the first time. This was not the reaction like a lot of us have. God, you know, this horrible thing is happening, and I know I don't ever talk to you, but I'm here today, and I need you to bail me out. That's not what's happening. Daniel had made consistent steps. He had discipline in his life. He spent time with God three times a day. And, and what is he praying for? What is he doing in his prayer? He's what? Giving thanks. Like I'm probably going to prison. At the very least, there's a good chance that I'm going to be killed. If I'm praying at that point, I'm like, God, bail me out. But see, this is what Daniel does every day. He prays three times a day. He's specific in his prayers, giving thanks to God for all the blessings and all that he's done in his life, for allowing him to be a part of his plan. Small steps that Daniel's taken in his life consistently that have led to who he is, the man of God that he is. And I'm willing to bet as you look at this verse and these prayers that, that Daniel prayed at the same time every day. He didn't just say, I'm going to pray three times a day. He was consistent. I bet there was a set time, three times a day, that no matter what, Daniel was going to spend time with God. Never underestimate how God can do something big in you and through you. When you take small steps towards God and the person that he wants you to be. Now, some of you may or may not know how this whole preaching thing works. I, I'll have people ask me, you know, how do you decide what you're going to preach on and, and all of those things. Uh, for me, 
when I preach on Sunday morning, I'm basically just preaching the sermon to you that God's been preaching to me during the week. So, so whatever God's getting me on, I just come and I'm like, hey, let me just kind of share with you the sermon God preached at me. So when I talk about these small steps and these disciplines and these things, like those, those are the areas that God's working on in my own life. And so as we think about these small steps that lead to, to big change, one of the steps that I'm doing just to myself in the morning when I wake up before I even get out of bed is I'm making a confession. Now, when I say making a confession, I don't mean like confessing sin, not that kind of confession. I'm making a statement that will help me align my life in the areas where I believe God wants me to align more fully. And here's my daily confession. I'm a child of God. I'm an overcomer. I want to honor God with my body and grow in his word. So I want to in the morning, hey, I'm a child of God. I'm an overcomer. Sin does not have its chains on me anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to make wise steps to be a healthy person. And I want to grow this year in my knowledge and understanding of God's word. So when I say that, I begin to align my life in those areas and take those small steps that I need to take to see big change in my life. And that's exactly what Daniel's done. Right, to set himself apart, to be able to have the faith, to look the, the lion in the face, or to, to object to the king's edict, Daniel had to, to make small steps in his life, disciplines that had started long before this moment of crisis. Daniel had focused on the who, who God is calling him to be. Now, these steps that we're talking about, they don't need to be huge. Matter of fact, it's better if they're small, because what happens? When, when we're motivated, you hear a sermon, you read a book, and, and you're going to change. What do you try to do? You try to change everything. If you're like, I'm going to read God's Word this year, you try to sit down the first day and read half the Bible. <laughs> And then last, you get through Genesis, you get through Exodus, you get to Leviticus, and it's like, I can't do this anymore, right? So it's small steps. You don't have to jump in and radically change everything, just small steps over time that lead to big change. If you want to be more generous this year, small step that you can take. We have those little generosity cards by all the exits of the church that just say God loves you. Just say, I'm going to keep one of those cards with me to remind me, and once a month, I'm going to be generous. Maybe you're an overachiever, you're like, once a week, I'm going to be generous. It's just a small step. You want to be a person that's organized, right? And and I'm just really preaching to my sons at this point, make your bed, right? If you want to be an organized person, start with, small step, just make your bed. You want to be a godly example, dads? To your kids, let them see you spending time in God's Word. Or better yet, go through a devotional with your kid. Just a small step. You want to be a person that's focused? Start your day with three priorities. If you want to be healthier, and now I'm really stepping on toes, quit drinking soft drinks. Right? Just, just little steps that help us become the people, the men and the women that God wants us to be. Create a system around who you want to become. Now, if you're like, that's great, Matt, for you organized people and you high achievers, but here's how it works in my life. I don't do systems. Well, actually you do. You wake up in the morning after hitting your snooze five times, so you're running late, so you don't eat breakfast, so you grab a Diet Coke, You jump in the car. You put your makeup on in the car. You're rushed, so now you're stressed. So you get to work, and you're frustrated, and you go through your day, and you drive home, and you eat an unhealthy dinner, and you binge watch Netflix, and you go to bed. That's a system. It's a bad system, but it's a system. It's a habit that you found yourself in. It's a routine. And how do we change bad systems and bad routines and lack of discipline. We take small steps that lead to big change. So let me give you just three very practical ways. And I promise you, if you will apply these 
take these small steps that God will do a big change in your heart and life this year. So creating some new disciplines. We talked about last week. The first thing is we have to pray about who does God want you to be? Because that's where we start. Who does God want me to be? And then here's some practical steps. First one's this. Make it obvious. Make it obvious. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. How many of you like to go to Costco? You love Costco. That, that's, like a, that's like a love-hate relationship. I love to go and I hate to go at the same time. Why? Because I can't go to Costco and just buy what I went there for. Has anybody ever done that? You've gone to Costco and you only bought the one thing you went in there for. Anybody? Okay, I think you're lying. I'm just going to tell you that straight up. I'm calling you out in front of everybody. I've never seen it happen. I go in there and I have my one or two things and and they know this. They put cool stuff on the aisles and I go in there needing, you know, uh, 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 socks and I come out. I'm like, baby, look at this. It's 128 rolls of toilet paper. I just think we need this or the 10 gallon can of tomato syrup. Like, we need this. This is awesome. You can't get this at H-E-B. It's huge. And we come out of all this stuff. Why? Because we see things that are obvious, and they're not what's best, but they're easy. Same thing with Home Depot. Men, you like to go to Home Depot? I go to Home Depot, and I go in there for one screw, and I come out with a Milwaukee power tool set. I don't even use tools. Like, I just think they're cool. Just to have in my garage, I'm like, look at my tools, right? I don't even use them. It's just cool. I go in there for a screw. I come out with that. They know this. They put it on the aisle, on sale, cool power tool set, because they know it's obvious and it's easy. It's not what's best, but you're going to see it and you're going to want it and you're going to do something about it. That's why there's always online advertising. That's why they listen to you, by the way, on your phone. When you talk about something, all of a sudden the ads start popping up on your phone. You notice that? Targeted marketing that we, if we can put that before you, you're going to want it. They made the huge mistake Facebook did. One day I was flipping through and I saw this advertisement for like a Ferrari or something. I'm like, oh, cool. I want to look at that. Now they think I want a Ferrari. They're always sending me these ads. I keep texting them back, can't afford this, quit sending me this kind of deal, right, over and over. But they know because you're going to see it and it's easy and you're going to want it. So what you have to do to take a small step is you have to cue the obvious. Now my wife will testify that this is true in our, in our family. If you want to be healthy and part of that small step is I need to take vitamins, Small step, cue the obvious. I'm going to take the vitamins and I'm going to put them on the kitchen counter. So when I wake up in the morning, what do I see? Vitamins, what do I do? I take a vitamin. I ask my wife all the time, do you take your vitamins? No. Just set them out. That's all you have to do. Just set them out. You'll see it, visual cue. It's obvious and you can take your vitamin. Another thing, and this is true in my life right now. You can ask my boys, you can ask my wife. In, in our kitchen, on our dining room table, sits, I just got it this year, brand new, a new one-year Bible. Sitting on the dining room table. Why does it sit there? Because when I get up in the morning, I go to the restroom, I go and get a cup of coffee, I walk into the kitchen, what do I see? My one-year Bible. So I sit down because that's one of the small steps that I'm taking. I'm making it obvious. And I'm going to sit down and I'm not going to read half the Bible or four books. I'm reading that daily reading of the one-year Bible. Now, I hate to admit this in front of everybody. This, this week I turned 47 years old. So not only do I have my one-year Bible sitting there, you know what I had to add this year? A pair of reading glasses. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. It's depressing. Right? But you just, you just make it obvious. Cue the obvious. You want to read the Bible? Leave your Bible out where you can see it. You want to take vitamins? Set your vitamins out in the evening before you go to bed. You want to exercise? Pack your bag with your workout clothes. Put it by the back door so you have to trip on it on the way out. You make it obvious. The second thing is you make it easy. Obvious visual cue, I see it, make it easy. I'm not going to try to read half the Bible in one sitting. I'm going to read that day's 
Bible reading. You, you maybe have a one-year Bible. Maybe you have on your phone with you version. You can have the devotionals. It's sent to you. You wake up, you roll over, boom. There's the devotional. We're going to keep it really simple. We're going to make it easy. Another step that I'm wanting to take this year is, is I want to pray with Becky. We were talking about this driving over here even this morning. I, it's not our quiet time. Just in the morning before we go to work, hold her hand, quick prayer together before we start our day. Just a little step. A little step that leads to a big change. Maybe you're a, 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 someone that likes to journal. You like to write. And so you've tried that, and you journaled and journaled and journaled, and you did that for about five days and filled up half a notebook, but then you're like, I don't have anything else to say. Just one sentence. Just, just journal one sentence. It doesn't have to be everything. One sentence. Make it easy. You want to be healthy before you eat breakfast? 20 push-ups, one plank. That's it. Or if you're like, I can't do that. Three push-ups and no plank. Something like that. Make it easy. Obvious, cue the eye, make it easy, small step. See, we don't have goal problems, most of us in our life. We have good goals. They're sincere goals, they're true goals. We have system problems. We haven't set up a system to be able to accomplish the goals that we feel like God has given us. And so what you need, again, are, are kind of cues, something that cues your action. So you say, I will do blank before I blank. I will read the Bible before breakfast. Just a simple cue. I will do push-ups before I eat the cupcake. Something like that. All right? Something that you do before you do something else. Make it obvious. Make it easy. And the last thing is make it consistent. What do we see here in Daniel? He got down on his knees three times a day, prayed and gave thanks before his God. How many times a day? Three times a day. Was that the first time they'd ever prayed? No. He had already taken those steps. He'd already applied those disciplines in his life. They say that it takes 40 days to make a habit. Most of us don't get to 40 days, thus it never becomes a habit. So we make it obvious, we make it easy, but we have to make it consistent. Small steps lead to big change. Again, typically we have a burst of motivation. We try to do everything. We give up. Small steps consistently have a system. God has something better for you this year. You believe that? God has something better for you this year. And you might think, yeah, but if I'm just reading a little five-minute devotional or ten-minute devotional, does God really care about that? Yes, God honors the small steps that we make. He meets us there. He begins to transform our hearts. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10 says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work began. Right? He rejoices in those small steps, those small steps that we're, we're taking. And, and it's not 50 small steps. Two or three small steps, small things small changes, that it's amazing. If you could have two or three every year, over 10 years, how many things have changed? Over 20 years, how many things in your life, how many disciplines have changed? Small steps, big change. We have a system. We make it obvious. We make it easy. We make it consistent. God honors those small steps in our life to bring about big change in our hearts. The who. Who does God want you to be in 2020? Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we thank you for something as simple as this. God, these small steps, these practical steps that seem insignificant, but God, they lead to big change. Because what happens in my life is I, I try to jump in and I try to change everything. And then I mess up or I forget or I fall short and then I'm frustrated and then I give up. And God, I don't, I don't think I'm the only person that, that has done that and feels that way. So God, I, our, my prayer is that, that Lord, we would, one, pray about who do you want us to be this year. And then that we would take small steps in our life 
that would lead to big change, little adjustments, just spending a little bit of time in your word every day, leaving out our Bible so we're reminded visually that we need to spend time in your word. Maybe it's prayer that we would pray, just spend a few minutes talking to you each and every day and that those small steps, small disciplines would lead to big change. Father, the the most significant step that we can take is a step to trust you as, as our Savior. God, there's maybe some here today, they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's never been a moment that that they've recognized their need for Jesus. And God, I pray that right now would be that time that they would take that small step. God, you pursue us big time. God, we would take that small step in just responding to you, Father. I pray that people would be saved today. So God, we, we pray, we ask the question, who do you want us to be this year? And God, as you reveal that to our hearts and minds, Lord, I pray that we would, we would make those small steps that lead to a big change, Father. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us online today and worshiping with us at Mission City Church. We hope that's been a blessing to you. If maybe today you pray to receive Christ or you have spiritual questions, uh, we would love for you to check us out on our website, missioncity.church. And there's a tab there. You can email us, connect at missioncity.church. And we would love to communicate with you, talk to you about the spiritual decision maybe you made today. You also can go to our website and you can find other teachings. You can see our worship ministry. You can see ways that you can connect uh, to our church on an ongoing basis. You can also support the ministry through your financial giving on our website as well. And we invite you to do that. And if you're in San Antonio, hey, just come live. We have two locations that we would love to meet you in person at. I pray that you have a great week. Hopefully you'll come back next week and maybe check us out again. But just know that we're praying for you and thankful for you today.